So we've been talking about economic development and the intersection of policy. And so at this point, we're, we'll talk through some of the foundational um, theories that have driven development economics and development policy over the last 70, 80 years. So during the Great Depression, a new model or a new theory of economic um, development emerges, um, the Herod Domer model, named after economists Herod and Domer, um, in which they argue that we can think about economic development as a function, or that we can think about an economy as a function of capital, basically um, capital being machines or things that can be turned into machines like money, um, and that there's a relationship between the number of machines in your, your country and how much you're cranking out each year, and that's that function, and so it wouldn't necessarily be you know, an exact number, but it could be a relationship that we would see more machines and more stuff. Um, and so if that's, if that's how we're thinking about the economy as a function of just machines, um, then if you want to crank out more stuff, then you need to increase your capital. And so the second equation there um, is the, the triangle is delta is a Greek capital letter D, which is oftentimes used to mean change. And K is capital because in German, capital starts with a K and Marx wrote a book called Das Kapital. Um, so change in capital equals I for investment um, minus the squiggly D, the depreciation um, coefficient, which is again the Greek letter D, but lowercase this time, which means sort of the change or the breakdown in capital, the breakdown of machines. And so you could think about growth from the Herod Domer model perspective as a change in the cap in your, your stock of capital, where you're thinking about increasing it by buying more machines investment and some machines break down. And if you're buying more machines that are breaking down, you're gonna have a positive increase in capital and that's gonna to lead to a positive increase in GDP. And if you're not buying enough machines to replace the ones that break down, your pool of capital is gonna shrink and therefore your economy is gonna contract. And so this works on a very rudimentary level, but it makes some really big assumptions about how economies work. One of those assumptions is that um, there's always an export market available, right? That the only constraint is whether or not you can crank out more stuff. Um, and so it's, it fits very well with that idea of externally driven growth, right? That you can always um, sell whatever stuff you're cranking out. It also assumes that labor productivity and technology don't matter, that as long as you buy more machines, you can always plunk a person in right behind that machine and they will make the machine operate. Um, and I guess maybe one way of thinking about this is if you're in the middle of the Great Depression and you've got 15% unemployment rate, if you can buy more machines and put people to work at those machines, when you reach that point where you're out of people to put to work at machines, well, then we can have a conversation about how the Herod Domer model doesn't work um, because we've solved unemployment, we've solved the Great Depression. Um, but for a longer term forecast, that's maybe more problematic. Um, also, we're not necessarily building in change over time or better machines. But again, we're thinking short term forecasts. What do we need to do to get economic growth next year? And the Herod Domer model actually helps us to answer that question. The economists will work out what that relationship is between capital, between machines, and the size of your economy. And then they'll say, okay, we want 5% economic growth next year. What do we need to do in terms of buying machines to get 5% economic growth? and we figure out what's the dollar value of what we need to have on hand. And then we ask the question, where are we gonna get that money? Can we get that money from the population saving, right? People you know, earning money in their jobs and then putting that money in the bank and then people taking up business loans from the bank to buy machines to start businesses or to expand businesses. Are people able to save that on their own? And if they're not, then there's what we call a financing gap. There's a gap between what people can save in their economy and what you need to get the kind of growth you, you want in order to you know, change quality of life, lift people out of poverty, whatever. Um, and so the idea of the Herod Domer model is that we can figure out what we need to inject into an economy to get massive economic growth, um, to cover that financing gap and really drive forward an economy by simply buying more machines.
So this is the model of economic growth that, that dominates economic thinking at the end of World War II and ends up being sort of the, the catalyst for the creation of the World Bank. The World Bank is one of three organizations that was created at the end of World War II at a conference um, at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. So it's one of the Bretton Woods organizations. Um, and the World Bank is aimed at ending poverty globally and restoring global economic vitality after World War II, reviving the, the economies of, of Europe and Japan and, and um, undoing the devastation of World War II. Um, and so building on this idea of the Herod Dorner model, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development is created in 1945, and it's there to basically give loans to businesses and private firms to finance projects. Essentially, the idea is we're going to cover the financing gap. And so you could think about the Marshall Plan and other sort of massive investment programs as sort of fitting within that larger idea of, of um, the Herod Dorner model. Um, by 1956, there's a new conversation that's emerging within the development community. They're starting to think that maybe just simply throwing loans at governments or, or isn't the most efficient way to spark um, uh, an increase in capital within an economy. And there's starting to be a new conversation about maybe how do we get more cash in the hands of businesses. And so the World Bank sort of huddles up and they create a new organization um, that's going to sort of pair together with the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and create the World Bank Group, so a group of different organizations doing slightly different things. This new one is the International Finance Corporation. Its job is basically to help companies in the developing world get access to capital, to get access to the cash they need to buy machines to grow their economy. Um, by 1960, there's a new conversation going on that maybe um, it's difficult to get economic growth when there's fundamental um, problems in terms of health and, and quality of life and education in the country. And so a new organization is founded to funnel resources, in this case, interest-free loans to the poorest states to provide things like um, hospitals or provide sanitation or clean water um, so that the population isn't dying off from treatable diseases um, and therefore people can start investing long-term and, and planning long-term and not scrambling to just you know, meet their basic needs and stay alive. Um, shortly after that, there's a um, surge of um, sort of Marxist revolutions all over the world in the Cold War, and the World Bank huddles up and says, well, this is really making it difficult for companies to come in and invest in, in developing countries because they fear Marxist revolution. So we'll create a new organization, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, so that if there's a Marxist revolution and property gets seized, we'll help countries sort of work through how to compensate corporations. That way maybe they're more willing to invest in these countries and meet the financing gap. And then lastly, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency is a fifth World Bank group organization, um, which is more of an insurance program for companies that are willing to invest in developing countries to build factories and to build machines, increase that stock of capital. And so they're, they're sort of expanding the scope, but it's all sort of aimed at that same basic problem, trying to get more money into countries to buy machines and infrastructure. And the idea is that that's going to then translate into economic growth um, and a, a larger GDP. So we should probably talk about the record of the Herod Dolmer model and this approach to development. And to be perfectly honest, it's pretty spotty. Um, the World Bank was founded with the mission of ending poverty globally. Um, poverty is still a problem globally, uh, almost 80 years after the founding of the World Bank. And so when we look more historically, what we see about the Herod Dolmer model is that it seems to fit some key cases really, really well. If we look at Soviet industrialization, one of the fastest periods of industrialization the world had ever seen up until um, China's sort of emergence and entering of the global economy in, in the 1980s, but Soviet industrialization from, from 1920 through about 1950 is, is an amazing feat. And it's an amazing feat in which they went from a country with essentially no industry to the world's second largest industrial power. And they did that in part by um, increasing their stock of capital that it was done in a couple of ways. It was done by essentially starving Ukraine, taking all the grain, selling it, and using it to feed workers who were moved into factories and the cash being used to, to buy factories. Um, it was increased, the stock of capital was increased by looting machines from Eastern Germany. 
So it was, a, let's say, an unconventional way of increasing the stock of capital in an economy, but it had the effect of rapidly industrializing the Soviet Union. Similarly, after World War II, uh, the United States injects um, about $20 billion in today's dollars into Europe to rebuild Western Europe and to help you know, replace infrastructure that had been destroyed in the war. And you get this European miracle where uh, uh, previously successful economies have been blown to smithereens by bombing within a generation have returned to the status of industrialized powers. And so there was initially a lot of enthusiasm that really the only thing you need to do to get economic growth is throw money at the problem. Um, since 1950, however, um, economists who've looked at this question, particularly William Easterly, who's a huge critic of the financing gap model and the Herod Domer model of, of economic development, he's found that essentially covering the financing gap has had no effect on economic growth, which that means that some countries who've had the financing gap covered have done well, others haven't. It doesn't really seem to make a difference um, one way or another. And so when we're thinking about this, there's a couple things to maybe reflect on. One is that maybe the financing gap model is just ridiculous, right? Maybe this is a bad way to think about growth. And this idea that if we just get more machines, we get more growth doesn't really work in the real world. A second way to think about it is that maybe we're comparing apples and oranges, that maybe there was something about the Soviet Union in the first part of the 20th century or European countries after World War II that's fundamentally different as than situations happening in maybe Africa or Southeast Asia or Latin America where, or South Asia, where simply throwing money at a problem isn't going to spark industrialization quite the same way. And I think maybe there's an argument to be made there, right? In the case of Europe at the end of World War II, you had a population that had fairly high levels of literacy and education um, that had had a successful industrialized economy and was literally putting factories back where they had been before. That's a different problem than trying to take a country that hasn't had an experience of industrialization and figuring out what that's going to look like and figuring out what's the best way to make that work. And so one argument is that maybe there's prerequisites, maybe certain things have to be in place before you can simply throw money at a problem and, and purchase machines and increase economic output, um, that it's maybe a more complex relationship. And as we talk through this, this problem of development, we'll start building in more of the pieces of this complex pattern.